Hello everyone. In this video, we will be discussing the AWS Well-Architected Framework and its five pillars. My name is Saurav Sharma and I'll be presenting this video. This video is produced by Cloud Yeti. We are based in the Washington DC area and provide cloud computing and DevOps training and consulting services. You can find us uh, by visiting these links. So let's get started with the video. What is the well-architected framework? After designing and reviewing thousands of customers' architectures on AWS, AWS has identified the best practices and core strategies for architecting systems in the cloud. This framework that AWS came up with is based around five pillars. The mnemonic for uh, this I like to uh, use is CROPS, C-R-O-P-S. Uh, and the pillars are cost optimization, reliability, operational excellence, performance efficiency, and security. We'll look at each of these pillars in the following slides. So for a quick overview of all these pillars, operational excellence pillar describes the ability to run and monitor systems to deliver business value and to continually improve supporting processes and procedures. Security pillar describes the ability to protect information systems and assets while delivering business value through risk assessments and mitigation strategies. Reliability pillar describes the ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service disruptions, dynamically acquire computing resource to meet demand and mitigate disruptions such as misconfigurations or transient network issues. The performance efficiency pillar describes the ability to use computing resources efficiently to meet system requirements and to maintain that efficiency as demand changes and technologies evolve. Cost optimization pillar describes the ability to run systems to deliver business value at the lowest price point. So where can I find this framework? AWS has come up with the well-architected white paper. And in this white paper, which is about 86 pages in length, you can find all the findings and best practices and so on. Each pillar also has its own white paper. So there are overall six white papers. You can find all the white papers by visiting this link. So this is the link, the well-architected page on AWS. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll find six white papers, one for the whole framework, one for operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, and cost optimization. I'll be putting the link in the description below for you to check this page out. So let's quickly talk about the white paper anatomy. How is the white paper written? Right? The white paper consists of a few different things. First of all, it consists of overall guidelines for designing a well-architected system. The white paper also contains design principles per each pillar. There are lots of overlaps of services and methods in each pillar. Right. So the recommendations that you see in one pillar can also be used uh, in other pillar. For example, CloudWatch and CloudFormation, these are services featured again and again uh, for best practices and design principles. So overall, the general design principles for the well-architected framework is you stop guessing your capacity needs. Instead, you want to use things like auto scaling, monitor your systems and you know scale as you need, scale up and down as you need. You want to test systems at production scale. The cloud makes it really easy to set up a whole new environment with a lot of resources using services like CloudFormation, where you can spin up uh, environments in a few minutes and as soon as you're done, you can tear down the environment. So this lets you test systems at production scale. So testing should be encouraged and used in your uh, practice so that you can test systems before 
uh, you deploy them and find out what could fail. You also want to automate to make the architectural experimentation easier and this ties back to the uh, testing. Uh, CloudFormation lets you automate the deployment of the uh, resources in uh, the, and aids you in the creation of the whole environment so that you can automate to do things quicker and also uh, automation will make sure that the human error is mitigated. You want to allow for evolutionary architectures, meaning if uh, you have an application that is using an EC2 instance and runs 24-7, if it makes sense, you want to look into AWS Lambda or serverless architecture so that you can replace that EC2 instance with Lambda. And similarly, you can use many other services that are coming up that are being released every month, every day by AWS to do things in a better way, in a cost-effective way, in an easier way. You wanna drive architectures using data. So you wanna collect a lot of metrics and see exactly how your application is behaving. Uh, if you need more resources, and after you analyze the data, you can provision the right type of resources. So you want to use uh, data to drive architectures. And finally, you want to improve through game days. Now, game days are events where you test for uh, things like disaster recovery, what happens if one of your uh, region goes down, what happens if one of your availability zone goes down. So you basically test things and you perform these failover uh, mechanisms and uh, exercises to make sure that you can recover from a bad event. All right, so those are the general design principles. Now let's look at the first pillar, which is the operational excellence pillar. If you go to this link and scroll down, the main uh, Will Architected Framework white paper can be accessed by clicking here. And this is the white paper. We want to go to the operational excellence pillar now. So the operational excellence pillar includes the ability to run and monitor systems to deliver business value, to continually improve supporting processes and procedures. The design principles for this pillar are perform operations as code. And you can use service like AWS CloudFormation to do this. When you perform operations as code, you limit human error, right? Because you're not clicking through the management console to provision things. And you also enable consistent responses to events and you save a lot of time. You also wanna annotate documentation uh, using automation. Instead of creating handcrafted documentation, which people hate to do, you wanna um, automate documentation whenever every build happens. And this way, not only humans can read the documentation, but also computers can use that documentation. You wanna make frequent, small, reversible changes. And this lets you reverse or roll back when something fails. And you wanna refine operations pr procedures frequently. As you evolve your workload, you want to change the process and you want to get together and review and validate all the process if they are still the best way to do things if they are effective and so on you want to anticipate failure by performing pre-mortem exercises to identify potential sources of failure so that they can be removed or mitigated and you want to fa test for failure scenarios and validate your understanding of their impact so once again simulation and game days come into play and you wanna learn from all the failures, right? Whenever something breaks or you fail, you make a mistake, you wanna document that and you wanna learn from that. So the next time you don't wanna make the same mistake again. And for this, you wanna share uh, what you learn across teams so that the team members benefit. And if you document the failures and the response uh, that will mitigate the failures, then the next time, you're less likely to make that mistake again. Now, the white paper also contains best practices. There are questions within the best practices that you can look at and answer, and you can find out 
you know if you're using the best practices or not and the second par part of this white paper is full of questions like these in fact these questions are in the second part as well and let's quickly go to the second part so on page 46 starts the appendix section of the white paper where you find questions answers and, and best practices for operational excellence you have uh, questions and best practices here so that, that you can see if you're using the best practices let's look at an example for one of the questions how do you design your workload so that you can understand its state design your workload so that it provides the information necessary for you to understand its internal state for example metrics logs and traces across all components this enables you to provide effective responses when appropriate so the best practices are you want to implement application telemetry and track things like queue depth, error messages, and response times. You want to implement and configure workload telemetry. You want to implement user activity telemetry. For example, recording click streams, uh, tracking sessions of your customers and users. You want to implement dependency telemetry when a dependent resource is out of touch you want to find out for example uh, a database on your on-prem data center if it's not available you want to find out by using monitoring and telemetry and you also want to implement transaction traceability so these are the best practices that you can implement for one question and as you can see for operations pillar there are a total of nine questions right nine questions now going back to the best practices section on page seven of the operational excellence the best practices are divided into three groups prepare operate and evolve and these um, questions also fall under these groups right for example under operate question number six seven and eight fall and under evolve uh, there's one question and some best practices listed so uh, this way you can read through the documentation and find best practices and design principles for operational excellence the major services for operational excellence are cloud formation for performing infrastructure as code cloudwatch to monitor your systems and also aws config to make sure that you're compliant and you know things are being tracked and so on Let's look at the security pillar now. The security pillar includes the ability to protect information systems and assets while delivering business value through risk assessments and mitigation strategies. The design principles for the security pillar are implement a strong identity foundation. And what this means is you wanna implement the principle of least privilege and enforce separation of duties with appropriate authorization for each interaction with your AWS resource. So basically, you don't want to give a developer an access to all of your S3 buckets if they only need access to one bucket, right? You want to implement principle of least privilege. And you also want to um, look into things like not using long-term credentials and using IAM roles whenever possible and things like that. The second design principle is enable traceability. This can be achieved by monitoring, alerting, and auditing events. You also want to apply security at all layers. For example, you can uh, use a web application firewall to filter application traffic. And then you can use a VPC network access control list to control some traffic there and security groups uh, to, you know, control traffic at an instance level. So at each layer, you can add the best security that your application needs. So you wanna automate security best practices. You can do this by using cloud formation, by using SDKs and AWS Lambda to react to event uh, as they happen. You wanna protect data in transit and at rest. You wanna make sure that your sensitive data is encrypted and not only at rest but also in transit you want to keep people away from data as much as you can and you want to prepare for security events you have to have a plan uh, when 
uh, a security incident happen. So you want to create a process uh, for incident response and how you will recover from that incident. You can read through the best practices that are summarized by these five points, identity and access management, detective controls, infrastructure protection, data protection, and incident response. The major services for the security pillars are identity and access management, KMS or the key management service, CloudTrail, and web application firewall. And there are many other services that are um, useful for implementing the security best practices on AWS. Now let's look at the reliability pillar. The reliability pillar includes the ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service disruptions, dynamically acquire computing resources to meet demand and mitigate disruptions such as misconfigurations or transient network issues. The design principles for the reliability pillar are test recovery procedures. Once again, you can test procedures by performing pre-mortem and by performing tests in a testing environment that you can quickly provision with service like CloudFormation. You want to automatically recover from failure and this is possible by monitoring a system for key performance indicators so that you can trigger uh, an event when a certain threshold is breached. For example, when your EC2 instances are uh, getting a lot of traffic and your CPU utilization is rising, uh, then you can add an EC2 instance using an auto scaling group. And this is possible because of CloudWatch monitoring and uh, service like auto scaling. This will make sure that your application is reliably running. You want to scale horizontally to increase aggregate system availability. So what this means is instead of having one large resource or one large EC2 instance, for example, you want to replace that with multiple smaller resources to reduce the impact of a single failure. You want to reduce the single point of failure. So distributing requests across multiple smaller resources uh, will give you higher reliability. You want to stop guessing capacity. So instead of guessing capacity, what you want to do is use things like uh, auto scaling to scale up and down as needed. Um, and you also want to monitor things so that you can use that data to provision the right resource. You also want to manage change in automation so that the changes to your infrastructure uh, is not done manually and you know if someone is not clicking through uh, the management console which brings the chances of making a mistake right so if you automate changes then the mistakes are mitigated are reduced and you have a higher uh, chance of having a reliable system the best practices for the reliability pillar are captured by these three areas, foundations, change management, and failure management. You can read through these to get an idea of what the best practices are. But now let's move on to the third pillar. The third pillar is performance efficiency. The performance efficiency pillar includes the ability to use computing resources efficiently to meet system requirements and to maintain that efficiency as demand changes and technologies evolve. And the design principles for the performance efficiency pillar are you want to democratize advanced technologies. AWS now gives you ability to use machine learning by just using an API. So you want to use things like these to do things that wasn't possible before. Cloud computing gives you these abilities and services and you want to use them for a better performance. Go global in minutes. AWS has a global infrastructure consisting of regions and zones and also edge locations around the world so that you want to use this infrastructure to go global in minutes and get closer to your customers and users. You want to use serverless architectures. Serverless ar architectures remove the need for you to maintain and run servers and carry out traditional compute activities and also admin tasks. You want to experiment more often. With CloudFormation, you know, creating a whole new environment is easy. And to get your performance higher, you just want to experiment and test as much as you can. And with the cloud, with the pay-as-you-go model, 
you know you can try different things out you can try a different service you can try uh, a different resource and only pay for what you use and tear down the environment tear down the resources after you are done so you want to experiment more often to increase your performance and finally there's a point called me mechanical sympathy basically meaning that you, you want to use technology that aligns best to what you are trying to achieve this relates to you know what kind of data access patterns you have and according to that you want to select the right storage and database for example if you want to access your data immediately you don't want to save things on Amazon Glacier storage class because with Glacier even with expedited retrieval you have to wait for five minutes or so and most of the times it's five to seven hours to get your data back so you want to look into these things the best practices for performance pillar are summarized by these four areas selection selecting the right service reviewing uh, the performance monitoring and making trade-offs so you want to select the right type of compute it could be instances containers or functions you want to select the right type of storage uh, for example EBS or S3 you want to select the right type of database is it NoSQL or RDS you want to select the right type of networking uh, environment you want to review monitor and finally you can make trade-offs right with trade-offs you use things like a read replica for your database or CloudFront for content delivery elastic cache to save your frequently accessed queries so you may be paying a little bit more but you end up getting a lot more performance so you want to look into these things as well the major services for performance efficiency are CloudWatch to monitor CloudFront for content delivery elastic cache for caching and auto scaling uh, for scaling up and down as needed and there's also other services that are uh, that can help you with performance efficiency let's look at our final pillar and the final pillar is cost optimization pillar it is also a very important pillar you want to make sure that you're not paying too much for services um, which may affect your business negatively so the cost optimization pillar includes the ability to run systems to deliver business value at the lowest price point some of the services and methods you can use for cost optimization are using AWS Cost Explorer to see what's costing you money, what services or what projects are costing you money. You want to tag resources. Tagging resources, make sure that you can filter by tags so you can separate your different projects by tags and see how much each project is costing. So you want to tag resources and obviously you want to use services like auto scaling so that you can scale up and down based on demand or based on schedule the design principles for cost optimization are adopt a consumption model pay only for the computing resources that you require so this goes back to turning off your development and test environments in the night so that you can use a schedule based uh, rule to turn off your EC2 instances at night using either auto scaling or using an AWS Lambda um, function to turn off instances at night and turn them back in the morning again you want to measure overall efficiency you want to measure the business output of the workload and the costs associated with delivering it you want to stop spending money on data center operations now this is already done when you come to the cloud so you don't have to worry about this except for if you're not fully in the cloud you know you have to uh, compare your cost of operating fully in the cloud and um, you know a hybrid architecture and you wanna you wanna go towards reducing the data center footprint and you wanna stop doing the heavy lifting for racking stacking and powering your servers depending on your workload you know you wanna consider moving to the cloud fully you wanna analyze and attribute expenditure and you can also track and analyze expenditure by teams by a certain person or by a whole project so you want to do things like this to analyze consistently and you also want to use managed and application level services to reduce cost of ownership so this means using a service like Amazon RDS where you don't have to install patch and 
manage your database and AWS does it for you. So when you do this, you reduce the total cost of ownership because you don't have to pay someone to just manage the servers. So you want to look into things like the managed services so that you can lower your total cost of ownership. The best practices are the best practices uh, for cost optimization in the cloud fall under four points expenditure awareness, cost effective resources, matching supply and demand, and optimizing over time. You can read through uh, the best practices and look at the questions by visiting the white paper. And once again, page number 46, starting page 46, you get the appendix which has questions and answers and best practices so that you can look at a question and see how you do things and look at the best practices and find out if you are using the best practices. So I encourage you to go to this uh, well-architected framework white paper and find out what you are doing good and what you can do better. Now, if you don't know about this service called Trusted Advisor on AWS, Trusted Advisor is a service that gives you advice based on the five pillars of the well-architected framework. And you can access this by going to the AWS Management Console. I'm here in my Management Console. And if I type in Trusted Advisor, so as you can see, you get recommendation on the five different aspects, which is related to the five pillars of the well-architected framework. And you can look into the recommendations and apply them and get more cost effective, get more performance, get more security, get more fault tolerant, and also uh, keep track of the service limit. One more thing, there's a new tool called the Well Architected Tool, which was released on November 2018. And you can visit the tool similar to the Trust Advisor by typing in Well Architected Tool. And I've already uh, started doing this. This is just an example, but if I click on this uh, workload that I am reviewing, I can click on continue review and you know I get to answer these questions. Now, these are the same questions that are in the white paper and I can answer the questions and choose what I'm doing right now and I can make some notes on each of the question and go to the next question and towards the end I get a report and I can uh, find out what are the things that I need to do. Uh, so this can also be a helpful tool for you in implementing the AWS Well-Architected Framework. So with that, we've come to the end of this video. If you like this video, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also have courses on Udemy. We'll include the links to our courses in the description below. And we are based in the Washington DC area and provide training and consulting. If you uh, need those services, please contact us by emailing us at contact at cloud80.io. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please put them in the description below. If you have any recommendations, suggestions, also put them in the description below. We appreciate your feedback. Thanks again. See you in the next video.